I agree Asian parents want their children to become physicians due to financial security, but more so for status. There's no denying our parents enjoy ba boasting about their children in medicine. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty true. Um, I think although now with COVID, everyone's like, oh, why'd you become a doctor? <laughs> Don't go to work. Um, all right, so here's a question. Hi, as doctors and dentists, we usually don't have the basic know-how of economics and finance. How did you start a business without a base in these subjects? Did you have help in that arena? Um, Pam, you wanna take that? Um, sure, so I had no background at all. And my husband, um, who essentially ran my practice from the beginning, um, created it and ran it, had no background at all. And we just, honestly, we just Googled things and tried to figure out um, how you start, you know, how you um, have an S Corp, how you or an LLC, and then how you get a business license. Um, malpractice insurance, I think we're all kind of familiar with, um, but all of the other things we literally just Googled and kind of learned along the way. Um, and so I think I actually, I mean, Saya and I have not talked about this, but I think it would be useful, helpful to put out some kind of guide on just like all the basics when starting your own practice. Um, a lot of it is business oriented, but a lot of it is, is, is just kind of like knowing, understanding and knowing insurances and how they work and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we, we learned along the way and, and by we, I really mean mostly my husband and then he filled me in on the highlights. Um, and we're still learning. I mean, it's been three and a half years and, and we just bought our building, our portion of the building, um, about, a year ago and again that that was a, a learning curve that we had to um you know to to, to get on and to understand <laughs> yeah about you, Saya? yeah same thing so i was lucky that um it was actually my husband that convinced me to start my own practice which is what i something i mentioned before um but i have started other businesses without the help of him or anyone else and um and dead on what you said like i Google things, I asked people questions, and I also just started really, really small. Like, you know, I like would tackle one thing every week or every few weeks. Like, um, you know, I, for like for Fem Health, we, like I, two years ago, I just like got a trademark, you know, like that took me like, you know, I did the research on the lawyer and how to like get a lawyer that was gonna like not charge me a ton of money. And so I got like a pretty affordable lawyer who like got my, um got my name trademarked then i moved on to like building a website then i moved on you know so like i kind of like moved on to like different things um and yeah like youtube google like i learned all about trademarks and patents from the u.s patent office which has pretty much everything you need to know and um you know so it's like you can like do, like you can pretty much google anything um yeah uh so it's just a matter of like and then talking to people that have done it before um is really helpful too but yeah with the practice definitely um my husband was a, a huge component of and i don't think there's anything wrong with that either right like if you want to start something find a partner who fills the knowledge gaps that you don't have um if you want to get it off the ground quickly i think that's a huge advantage right like then you can just go like um which is kind of nice yeah, and I think you touched on this and we touched on it in our talk is that starting out really lean is helpful because no matter what mistakes you make at the beginning, I mean, you don't want it to be um, super expensive, a uh, super expensive mistake. So I think if you start really small and little, then you can grow from there as you're learning. Um, and I understand that in things like dentistry, there's a lot of equipment involved. Um, same in ophthalmology, you guys have a lot of equipment involved. So I can, I can see that that would be um, really daunting to have to buy all this stuff. So again, I would just start my piece of advice is always starting small um and yeah. with with time and with experience you just grow and at, the, at that point you're kind of um at least like reevaluating um your cost and your benefit benefits at that point yeah and you can be like super creative i mean i think we can like just quickly share some of the ways we bootstrapped like I um, definitely used to answer like my own phone a lot. And then I would be like, doctor's office. And they'd be like, oh, and then I'd be like, hold for Dr. Nagori. And then I'd be like, this is Dr. Nagori. Like just like being my own secretary. Sure. And, and um, I also like, I rented space um, for my father-in-law, which obviously made things essentially very cheap. And he had a sleep center. So it was 
like operate as a sleep center at night and it would be an ophthalmology office during the day. So we were like 24 seven using the space. Um, so there's like a lot of be creative about how you um, bootstrap and do you have any bootstrapping pearls you want to share? Yeah, I um, sim kind of similar actually. So I, I, I shared in the video that um, my husband would answer the phone our Google phone number, and he literally would be between cases. And I would have some Spanish speaking patients and his Spanish is really good. So he'd be like kind of in, in you know, like in the hallway, um, like between cases, like speaking Spanish on the phone, trying not to let anyone hear him at work and what was going on. And then when that started to not work as much for us, we got a virtual assistant that actually lives in Guatemala. And so- yeah she is so good she would google everything in san jose like where the physical therapists were where the mri machine was everything so it when you spoke with her on the phone it sounded like she was right there and she knew where everything was in the area and to this day three and a half years later because i do have live assistants now she does a lot of the um virtual stuff still and schedules patients i'll have patients come in and say oh like i was really hoping to meet angela is she here today like people will bring her <laughs> gifts and I've never ever told, uh, well, now I guess it's the cat's out of the bag, but I've never really told people, oh, she's, you know, she's virtual in Guatemala. I'll just be like, oh, she's off campus today. She's, you know, working from home. Oh, thank you for the gift. I'll give it to her. So, um, you know, there's, she's and, yes, she's off campus today. Exactly. And um, my live assistants, they all just kind of chuckle behind the desk because they're like, you're never, ever going to meet Angela because she lives in Guatemala. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, again, going back to starting small and then, you know, trying to find creative ways to, to do things like the, I think the Google phone number is huge. You can carry that with you wherever you go. If you're moving from space to space, you can transfer it to your cell phone so that you can answer calls yourself, you know, and yeah, um, for the evenings and the weekends. So, yeah. yeah, totally. And you can build your own website from like Wix or Squarespace. Like you don't need like yeah. at least start. Like I started my own website before we like had an SEO company go in and like you know do like do a complete revamp. But I just want to get to a few more questions. Yeah, let's do that before we have to go. Um, so, startup advice, please. Does one need to be in the it environment, uh, like Silicon Valley? Um, how does one connect with the right people? Um, so I would say that um, it, it helps. Like I started Simple Health when I was in New York and definitely um, I met my co-founders there. And, you know, I, I think being in New York helped me a lot, meeting the right people to get things off the ground. But that being said, now um, we're seeing more and more opportunities to connect with people virtually and way more people are obviously open to it. So I think you just need to, again, go back to, I mean, I hate to say the word hustle again, but it's like hustle, meet people. Um, I wrote a lot of cold emails, cold calls, um, you know, warm intros are definitely helpful. So if you can find a connection to someone that's doing something you're interested in, get a warm intro, it makes a difference. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I don't think you absolutely need to be in that environment anymore. Um, and COVID in that way has helped a lot of people that maybe are not in New York or San Francisco um, because it's almost all the same now. Um, so I think it's actually a pretty ripe opportunity to connect with people um, if you want to get into the startup world. Pam, you want to comment? Yeah, I think um, those are all great tips. I, I actually, I think that one of the things that Alia told me early on was um, get your LinkedIn profile going. Um, business people, we I, in medicine, I don't feel like we use it that much, but business people use LinkedIn. It's like your online resume and you can change it and you can have networks of people that vouch for you on there. So I think that's like something really simple is get your LinkedIn profile going and really beef it up with um, your training, your experience, that sort of thing, and um, make some connections through that. I also think blogging is a good way to get your um, kind of your narrative out there and just information that you can provide other people and then you can link that to your LinkedIn. So making some kind of digital footprint for yourself so that people can find you is helpful. And then obviously all that hustle you're talking about to go and um, kind of seek those opportunities out yourself. Yeah, and definitely on the hustle and blogging aspect, like I agree with all that 100% because now when someone reaches out to me, like they do have a fair amount of people that reach out to me about startup stuff. Um, I also look like, do have they done something in the past, right? Because like, obviously, if I have like, five equal people, but like, you know, two of them have their own 
community and blogs and they are already like have a track record of doing something it's it's very attractive to me to like offer that person an opportunity or get that person involved versus someone who sort of hasn't like because it's it, it costs i mean it, it almost costs pretty much nothing to start a blog right it's like very inexpensive to do that um and so i think that like that's great advice again linkedin profile great advice because it's free um so i think those are those are awesome pearls um another question about med school here pam so the the person asks hi i had a question regarding any advice you'd give for med school bound students who are interested in pursuing the entrepreneurial side of medicine anything we could do now experience education to get a proactive start um you want to take that sure um God, that's a good question specific courses i mean i think honestly listening to someone like alia and saya and or me, maybe a little bit of me you guys have been doing this for a little while like i think that um that is a really good um start and then on facebook there's a few non-clinical medicine groups and i think on there um there's some different stuff on there also with different uh conferences and trying to keep kind of a flow to those but i think what we can do sai is maybe we can start um if you guys follow us on our instagram we can start shouting out a few different conferences and workshops that that um we're aware of because some of it just is kind of in the circles of people that we know yeah and so i think that that would be good but i think if you're in medicine even if you're a med student or resident get a linkedin profile going i mean i know ad boards are looking for residents. I don't know about med students, but they're looking for residents and people kind of earlier in their training. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any? Uh, yeah, it's funny. I actually used to host a conference um, for this exact purpose, um, but we had to cancel it um, in March because of COVID. So yeah, we might, it's called the Medicine Innovation Entrepreneurship Conference, but um, you know, we, we may bring it back next year. Um, just, I guess we'll have to see what happens with this pandemic. Um, but uh, I think we have room for one more question. Yeah, there's a um, question from Jasmine. Um, psych here, I'm really passionate about working with an underserved population, Medicaid, Medicare, but at the same time would love the idea of autonomy and flexibility of a private practice. Any tips of reconciling these two interests? Um, that is a really good question. And after, actually, the um, I've got a, a couple more talks in the next hour or two about kind of designing the life you want and private practice. Um, you can absolutely, you know, start a practice um, and work with the insurance and payer mix that you want to work with. Um, and also, you know, have like an out of network practice or do something on the side that, you know, like, in, God, it's psych. There's so many ways you can go with this, even in COVID with telemedicine and telehealth and kind of do that. So I think you really can design what you want. You just have to set those goals and intentions you know write them out and try to figure out what percentage of things that you want so for me flexibility was number one i wanted to be able to drop my kids off at school in the morning pick them up and be there for all their activities um, my husband has a busier job than me and so he his hours are a little bit more strict and so i wanted to be the person that could could do that for my children so i designed that first and then i put all the other pieces in so it's not normal for surgeons to start at 10 or 11 a.m. for their first case, but I do because that's what I want. And so it, it, it makes things different, but um, it, it's possible to do. Yeah, no, for sure. And I agree with that. And I think one other way you could do the mix is have you could have like an established job with a university like a couple of days a week and then have a private practice the other couple of days. Um, and I think I know a lot of actually people that have done this and one of the nice things is you can have that steady salary coming in while you build your practice. I mean, you have to obviously figure out like non-competes and things like that. Um, make sure you're not like, you know, opening sure. a shop next door to your academic university. So they're not like pissed off, but, um, but there's like, you can always do like a part-time gig and um, yeah. And, and, and payer mix is obviously like, you know, you, you can choose whatever you want pretty much. 